Okay, so Shelley on the White River is kind of the title that I've given this, this lecture. Um, it's not completely an accurate description of the industry that was on the White River and had to do with these freshwater mussels, but it's easier than trying to explain um, a big, long, almost 100 years worth of stuff in less than a sentence. So um, really what I'm going to talk to you guys about are, is um, how freshwater mussels were, were, they were just the heart of this huge industry and it's something that is so overlooked. Um, I've taught Arkansas history, it's not in the books. I mean, this is something that a lot of people don't realize. Um, and where I work, this is a huge part of, we have a big exhibit on this. And I get so many people that come in and say, I had no idea. I never thought about where pearl buttons come from or what mother of pearl actually means. Um, and it's such, it has such a great big impact on our state's history and, and where I am in Desert on the lower White River, not just Desert. Um, it was a way of life. It was, it, it was this huge industry and it had a big economic impact on the state, but it was also a way of life for people where I work. And there are a lot of people that come in and, and this is part of their family history. This is their heritage. Um, and it's, it's overlooked and they get kind of bitter about that sometimes. But um, I, wanna, I wanna right the wrong, right? So let's start at the beginning. And it was a pearl rush. So everybody knows about the, the great gold rush, right? The 49ers. Arkansas had something pretty similar. Um, again, who's heard of that, right? But um, the Arkansas Klondike was what people called it at the time. Basically, in the mid-1800s on the East Coast, people discovered that there was a lot of freshwater mussels in the, United, in the rivers in the United States, and they could be harvested, and you could make a lot of money if you found a pearl that was just right. And as this industry spread, so it spread east to west, as most, most things in our country do, right, east to west, it started kind of in New Jersey and it spread along the waterways. Um, it didn't really get to Arkansas until about the 1880s, 1890s. There's a little bit of disagreement about what year it really kicked off. Um, I have seen documentation as early as 1888 saying that people were harvesting mussels to find pearls on the White River. Um, but most people think about the Black River, which is north of the White River and it flows into. Um, and there, 1897 and was the earliest date that they have people harvesting for the purpose of gathering pearls to be sold. Uh, it did kick off the pearl rush. What they were doing on the Black River kicked it off, but there is evidence that it actually started on the White River a little earlier than that. So, I don't know, documentation is not great at that time period, especially about something that was just beginning to be an industry. So, take that for, for whatever it's worth. Um, but late 1800s, people started doing this because they had already harvested all of the rivers east of here, and they had depleted the mussel beds. And so, they tried the Mississippi, and it wasn't great. And then they tried the black, and that was okay. The White River had more mussel beds. The White River had better pearls, more pearls. It was really great. Um, if you've ever seen a White River pearl, they're really pretty. Um, a lot of them are not what we think of as pearls, so they're not the really round, perfect stuff. So these are, this, this is all stuff out of our collection at our museum. These pearls all came from the White River. Um, they're not all white and people don't think about that, but they're not all white. A lot of them are gray or kind of a champagne color, which I think is really pretty, but apparently is not as popular, so it's harder to sell. Um, but I don't know if you can tell, they're not all round. I, I kind of like the variation. It is harder to sell them that way though. So that gives you an idea of what they were looking for in the beginning. In the beginning, it was all about pearls. So. This is a picture of a pearling camp on the Black River, um, about 1900. And it does kind of make me think about the gold rush where people would just come, they would just drop everything. They would leave their lives, quit their jobs, and move to the river to do this. Um, that was not everybody. So if you notice, there are a lot of women in this picture. This was probably taken during the summer. So in the summer, starting in 1897, 1897, 18. 98, 1899 were 
really big years, um, 1900 through 1905, there weren't as many people living in these purling camps. But basically people would just go and rent a little plot of land right on the riverbank for a dollar or two a month. And this is what they would do during the summertime. A lot of farmers would do this after they'd harvested their crops, things like that. Uh, but there were people that, that quit their jobs and moved to the river, and this is what they did full time. So it is kind of interesting where it's, sometimes it's families and sometimes it's, it's just men going to work on the river. Um, but they did, they lived on the riverbank, um, which put them really close to where they were working. It also put them really close to where they were processing the mussels. And I don't know if you guys have ever been around somebody who's steaming mussels. It doesn't smell good. So they were living where they were doing this. Um, it's not something that I would want to do. I didn't, I didn't bring any pictures of the process because this is a lunch lecture and I thought you guys would be eating and it is pretty gross. Um, I'll talk more about that later. But. So that picture of the uh, little stove there or oven on the left, mm -hmm. that's for Food, not for mussels. That's for food, not for mussels, right. So when they were harvesting, at this point, they're harvesting by hand. So um, the Black River is, is not very deep, especially where these purling camps were. They would find a sandbar and camp around that. Um, and they were just wading into the water, a lot of times waist deep. And you could just wade out and reach down and pick them up. So they were really focusing on the mussel beds on the shallow part of the river, um, Eventually they did use this, this, I don't know how well you can see, there's this big long tool right here, it looks kind of like a pitchfork. And it kind of is, it's basically two pitchforks that they've modified to kind of become tongs. Um, that was kind of adopted later in the process, so this is 1800, they, they wouldn't have had that when they first started. 1897, pearling rakes were not popular. As it went along, they had to develop more ways to harvest because they were depleting the muscle beds that were really easy to reach on the edge of the river, on the sandbars. So purling rakes are what came next. You could usually reach mussels about 14 feet deep. So it, it's, that's not the whole thing, it's really long. Um, and a lot of times children would help. And so there aren't any kids in this picture that I could see, which I thought was kind of strange because it was families a lot of times. And I have had people come into the museum and they wanna talk about this because they remember it from their childhood and they remember not these style of camps, but they remember as children going with their parents and being plopped in the water and told to pick up mussels. Mm -hmm. Or um, I had one gentleman come in and he said he had a bunch of siblings, it, three or four, and his mother told them they would hold hands and wade out into the water where the oldest was deeper in the river and the youngest was on the bank, and they would walk along the river bank and pick it up as they went. So there was a lot of child labor involved in this and more recently than we probably want to think about. Um, but it's not, that style of harvesting is not really labor intensive either. You're really just picking them up as you go along and kids tend to do that anyway when they're in the river. Um, the stove is for, is for cooking and not for the, pr the processing of the mussels. At this point, people would eat the meat out of the mussels after they process them. Um, that changes later on as water quality changes and as the quantity of mussels that are harvested changes, right? So if you're just picking up by hand, you could probably eat, you and your family could eat what you harvest in a day. Um, you'd get tired of them after a while, but you could eat them. Um, this is like, kind of like the gold rush. It was really inconsistent income. So for some people, they did this for three months and got rich. They bought a house, they bought land, they paid off all their debts. This is what they did. For other people, they went and did this and made next to nothing. So pearls, which is what they are looking for at this point, are really rare in a freshwater mussel, a natural pearl, right? And to find one that is commercially valuable is even more rare. So sometimes you struck it rich and sometimes you didn't, uh, which is why I like to compare it to the gold rush. And not only was it an inconsistent source of income, it was really an unsustainable business model. Um, what they were doing is, is over harvesting a really limited population of mussels because they were only harvesting the ones in shallow water um, and they were throwing the shells away. And so you're, you're harvesting thousands of these animals and only now and then you get something valuable out of them 
and you're discarding all of the rest and you have to kill them to get the pearls out. You have to kill them to open them to know whether or not they have the pearls. So once it's harvested, whether it has a pearl or not, it's dead. Um, so there was a lot of waste with this and the style of harvesting that they were using with purling rakes and with the waiting. Um, it really, they depleted the mussel beds. They would, once they found a bed, they took every mussel before they would move on to the next one. Um, obviously that is not a good thing to do from an environmental standpoint. And so this is actually um, parts of a New York Times article from 1902. Um, I have an issue because they call them clams instead of mussels. Uh, in, in all of the references that I found from this time period, they did that, so I don't know if that was just, it was more common to call them clams. Um, they are freshwater mussels, not clams, but that's what they call them. But so 1902, they're saying we're, we're over harvesting and we're going to kill them within two years. They didn't because the industry was changing within those two years. The way that they harvested and what they did with the mussels changed. But 1902, it started in 1897. So just a few years and there were already concerns over whether or not this was going to cause mass extinctions. Um, it did kind of cause a few extinctions or there are areas where certain mussels were a lot more popular and now it's really rare to find them. Um, it did not just kill them all out. They're still out there, uh, but it was, it was a concern. And I think it's interesting because we don't think about people in 1902 being that environmentally conscious, but because they were making money off of it, they were, right? So um, before this, there are changes going on. Before 1902, there are changes going on in Iowa, and they're going to impact Arkansas in a big way. And so I know people like, what does Iowa have to do with Arkansas? What does Iowa have to do with the White River, right? Because the White River that we're on starts in Arkansas and goes up to Missouri and goes back down into Arkansas. It doesn't touch Iowa. But there was um, a German immigrant in Iowa in the late 1800s, 1890s, and he had a lot of experience in Germany making buttons. And he usually made them out of bones and um, horns or antlers, hooves, things like that. When he came to the U.S. and he saw this industry, he saw, hey, they have a lot of mussel shells. He invented a machine that could turn the mussel shells into buttons. He already knew how to make buttons. Why not use these things that people are throwing away, right? So Muscatine, Iowa was kind of the center of button making in the United States. So they were making billions of buttons a year at, at the peak of their production. Um, Muscatine, Iowa was sometimes referred to as Pearl City because there were so many factories that did this. And almost all of the places in Arkansas that harvested mussels commercially shipped them to Iowa to be finished. So we, we talk about, and Somebody came up to me earlier and mentioned it. Button factories in Arkansas, they're not actually button factories. They're button blank factories, right? And so they would ship here. So a button blank factory looks like this. It looks like an old wooden building with a big pile of mussel shells in front or behind of it. Um, usually on the river, actually not all of them, which is pretty interesting, but People started harvesting mussel shells after this German guy said, I know what we can do with these shells. People started harvesting mussels for the shells instead of for the pearls. And that was a huge shift in the industry, right? And it also means there's a lot more money to be made because every mussel you harvest has two parts to their shell. Whereas every you know, one or two in every hundred has a pearl. So you're guaranteed to make money once this happens. Once we shift from let's just get the pearls to let's use the shells. Now people, when they harvested, um, even if they were harvesting and selling to companies, a lot of them kept a box or a rag or something in their pocket. And as they were processing the shells, when they found pearls, they would put it in their pocket and not tell anybody, um, right? That happens. And there were a lot of people that made a lot of money doing that. And then extra money working at, at the button factories. Um, but this is a lot more sustainable, and I really like that they were looking towards, let's, let, let's use everything. Um, so button factories. This is actually a picture of the button factory at Clarendon. Um, I think this picture is from about, about 1916. So the pearling industry, which is really what it started out as, would have died out 
had it not been for mother of pearl buttons. So now really we're talking about shelling. Um, there was a button factory in Desark where I work. It was right on the river. There was one in Duval's Bluff, which is the next town south of us on the river. There was one in Clarendon. There was one in Augusta. There was one in Newport, whether you consider it being on the White River or the Black River. Um, there was one in Batesville. There was one in Newark. There was one in Oil Trough. Um, on the Black River, there was one in Black Rock. There was one in Corning. There was one in Pocahontas. There was even one on the St. Francis River in Parkin, which is where the next Brown Bag Lecture guest is from. Um, they actually have a functioning button lathe which is the machine used to make the blanks. They do demonstrations occasionally. Um, you might have to request that though. Uh, we, have a, we have a button length in our collection. We don't have the engine to run it, so it's just for show. Um, when did the, the transition occur from, from pearls to, to buttons? Do you know precisely? It was really right around 1900 was when the transition. So when the German guy was was building up this button making factory in Iowa. It was right when the Pearl Rush was getting started in Arkansas. He actually started making buttons from mussels from other rivers. And then people from Arkansas started shipping there. So after the first two or three years when people decided they weren't gonna get rich from pearls, then they said, hey, let, let's, let's try this button thing that everybody else is doing. So again, it's, they, he started with like the Ohio River and stuff oh, first. Man. Um, John Bopel? I can spell it for you if you want me to, but uh, it's, it's B-O-E-P-P-L-E. -E. So it's a German name. It, it's fun to pronounce. Um, anyway, so these factories were, were everywhere. This is when people, when local people, when Arkansas people say, my uncle worked at a button factory, my grandfather worked at a button factory. This is what they were talking about and they weren't making buttons. They were making what comes before a button. They were making these. And so if you guys want to come up afterwards, I always bring props and you guys are welcome to look at them because it's teeny tiny. They were making these and it's just a little disc made out of the shell. And they're called plugs or blanks. I think it kind of depends on where you're from. Everybody in desert calls them blanks. I've heard other people call them plugs. It's a regional thing, I think. It's the same thing, but it's just, it's just a little disc. And if you notice on the back side, you still have the outside of the shell on there. They didn't do any of the finishing in Arkansas. They were just making the blanks. So people would harvest the mussels and ship them to the button factories. Most of them were on the river, so they would put them in barges and take them to the factories where they sold them by the ton by the ton, and I mean, pretty cheaply by the ton too, just a few dollars per ton of the shells. Um, and then at the factory, they had mostly men uh, working on the big lathe, where basically you held the muscle shell and you pushed push it into the lathe and you cut all these holes out of it. And they were paid uh, according to how many blanks they were able to produce and the quality of their blanks. So a good button cutter made more money, not only because they were faster, but because the quality was consistently better. When they shipped them to Iowa, that's when they turned them into buttons. The mother of pearl buttons that, that everybody has a jar of, that their mother had a jar of, that their grandmother had a jar. Like that's the button jar and you don't touch the button jar, right? The mother of pearl buttons. So that's what they turned them into. Um, interesting, side note, there was a button factory in Brinkley, even though it's not on the river, and that was because they had the railroad. So at Brinkley, they shipped it in by train car. I just always thought that was so interesting. They had to have one, even though they weren't on the river. Um, so anyway, so they shipped them in, they came in as the shells, they left as the blanks. And they again, a lot of times were shipped on the river to Iowa, um, occasionally by, by rail car, but not very often. And so what do you do with the leftovers? Right, because even though you're using the majority of the shell, you can only punch so many holes out of it, and then you're left with, you know, the, the little gnarly looking piece that has all the holes. Um, a lot of people would grind it up, and you can use it as lime for agricultural purposes. You can also use it as a calcium supplement for chickens. People did that as well. Um, also, 
I don't know if you guys have been to Desert. There aren't any rocks. <laughs> and that was something that I was not used to. It, it was kind of a shock to me. You can just dig forever, there's no rocks, right? So instead of putting rocks in concrete, they put mussel shells. Instead of having to ship in gravel, a lot of times they would grind it up and use it to pave roads. Um, that wasn't quite as extensive, but it, it did happen sometimes, and I just think that's really cool. Um, but there aren't any rocks, so they didn't have a lot of options. So to get this many shells, you can't just wait out in the water anymore, right? Those mussel shells have been, th those mussel beds have been depleted anyway. So this end, the finishing end of the industry has shifted. The harvesting end has shifted as well. So you see rigs like this. This is really the most efficient way to harvest mussels, and it's called a brailing boat. So, goodness, it's hard to explain without some kind of visual aid. And this is the best picture I have ever seen of a brailing boat. There are not many photographs of them because they were just work boats and nobody thought they were special. Why would you take a picture of that? That's silly. Um, anyway, I have, we have a braille at the park. I don't know how you would transport that and not get it hooked on everything. I have tried. Um, I would have brought it today if I thought that I wouldn't have to spend half an hour untangling when I got here. So basically you have, you have a John boat, not a huge boat, cheap boat, boat anybody could get. And then you have these uprights. So there's one here and there on each end. And then you have these big long bars. They were typically made out of metal. They sometimes were made out of wood. There wasn't like an industry standard for, for brails. And then you have all of these strings and in this particular picture, which I know is not great quality, you can see the round things are muscles that are actually on here. Um, they are connected to something. They're not just on the strings. So on the strings, you would fit three or four of these. This is what's on, this is what's on there. Um, and here you can see he's got them really high up. Not everybody did that. But usually three or four, I guess you could do five or six. Again, there wasn't a standard. This is called a crow foot hook. And where I work, we have a jig, a traditional lower White River jig that you can use to make these. So these were not commercially produced. These were, there was an old guy that lived in, in every river town and made these by hand, each one individually. Um, it takes a lot of hand strength and you are gonna cut yourself at some point, but it's not impossible to learn. Um, it's not even incredibly difficult, but there was a lot of thought that went into the process of how to make these. Um, it's really just three pieces of wire. There are a lot of different designs, the way that they would twist the wires, the gauge of the wire that they would use. But basically the design is always the same where you have a hook on one end or a loop on one end. This is where it would be tied to the string that's hanging down from the bar. And then it would have two or three or four hooks on the bottom. They are not sharp. It's not like a fish hook, right? They're, they're not sharp at all, um, unless you make them differently and then they can be sharp. They don't have to be sharp. Um, the thing about mussels is that they kind of catch themselves. So this system really takes advantage of a mussel's natural reflex. So mussels are, they sit on the bottom of the river, or on the bottom of the river, right? They're filter feeders, so they're open just a little bit all the time so that they can filter the river water and get the nutrients that they need. When something touches the mussel, they clamp shut, right? See where this is going? So you get a whole bunch of these crowfoot hooks and you tie them to a bunch of strings and you suspend the strings from a bar. You drop it in the river and you drag it over the muscle beds. As the hooks touch the muscles, they clamp shut on the hook. There's no bait involved, they're not sharp. The muscles really do just catch themselves. Um, if they were a little smarter, they probably wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this was really efficient, and so he has two, and I never really understood the significance of that. I actually know a guy who grew up doing this with his dad, and he's the one that taught me how to make crowfoot hooks, and he explained it to me. So what you do is that you have a braille on each side of your boat, and as you slowly go, go across the mussel beds in your boat, that's when you drop one of the brails down, only one. As you go across the mussel bed, you're catching all of the mussels. Right? Um, 
they didn't use motors for that part of it, and a lot of times the current wouldn't necessarily take them in the, the right direction across the muscle bed, so they came up with it, a, a, they called it a mule, but it's basically an underwater sail, which is pretty cool, and you would drop that under your boat, uh, and that you could use that to adjust how fast you're going and what direction you're going without having to use motors or anything, or without having to pole or oar or anything like that. So once you get to the end of the muscle beds, um, how do you know where the muscle beds are? The guy I asked told me that he grew up on a river and you just know. <laughs> you drag until you find them and then that's where it is. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so when you get to the end of the muscle bed, you pick up the braille, which would be extremely heavy. Um, he doesn't have that many muscles on his, right? They would be loaded down. And so you pick it up and put it on the uprights that he has, and then you drop the other braille and go back across the muscle bed. So this was a continuous process. So on that second trip, when you're going back to where you started, you're picking all of the muscles off of the hooks so that when you get to the end of the muscle bed, you pick up that braille and drop the original braille and go back across. So it's very efficient. And it also depleted the muscle beds. Right? So the, the muscle beds that these guys are harvesting from, though, are really, uh, they're a lot deeper than the ones where people were waiting and picking up the muscles. Um, I don't think they found all of them. You know, there are still muscles out there, so they didn't kill everything. Yes? How far did they hang that down the end? The braille? Yeah. How far it's on the bottom of the river. So however, however deep the river is, it, you have to have enough rope to get it on the bottom. And then you're just dragging it along. Yep. So there was a, usually you had a yoke. Mm, you can kind of see it. This the kind of thing that dips, that's a yoke. And they were usually made out of chain. And then you would have a big long rope or chain on top of that. Um, and the strings that they tied the crow's foot hooks on, things that you don't know until you talk to somebody who's done it, they used cotton twine. It was not, um, it was not mold resistant or anything because if they get caught on something, they wanted to be able to break the line. So crow's foot hooks were cheap. They sold them by the dozen. So you just break the line and go get some more later. Things I didn't know. So this is really efficient, but this is really, this is really fun, right? This is the fun, dangerous way to harvest mussels. Um, this, is actually, um, this is actually from our collection. So this is a picture of a helmet that we have in our collection. That is actually a picture from Dur Turner Brown's The Last River Collection, uh, which is pretty cool. And he made a book out of it. And in the book and in this collection of photographs, he actually documents the process of harvesting and processing mussels from the man holding his helmet to the man getting in the river to the man pulling up the bag of mussels to the steaming and going through and looking for pearls. I mean, from start to finish, he documents everything. It's a wonderful resource. Um, coincidentally, we have these up in our museum at the moment, um, and we also carry the book. But the book and that series of photographs was actually, um, it's cited as one of the inspirations for the movie Mud with Matthew McConaughey. So if you want to get kind of a feel of what this lifestyle was like, you can always watch a movie, right? <laughs> watch the movie. Um, so our helmet, and I don't know what his is made out of. Our helmet is made out of the water tank off of a hot water heater because it's homemade. So all of the diving helmets used on the White River were homemade. It wasn't like the big fancy diving bells that people use in the ocean. Um, people would use big metal drums. People would use the gas tanks out of Model Ts. Basically, anything that was metal that you could fit over your head, you could make a diving helmet out of. Um, Ours is kind of unique in that it has, it has this viewing thing in the front. It has a viewing port. Because most people saw that as unnecessary. They didn't include it in their diving helmets. When you get in the White River, you can't see the hand in front of your face. This is a psychological thing. This is to make you feel better <laughs> when you put this big metal contraption on your head. It, it's, that's all, it's a mental thing. It does absolutely nothing for you once you're in the water. You cannot see anything. So, um, things people don't realize. If you haven't been to the White River, it's really murky. Um, and it does have this big metal block. It's a piece of lead, and there's a matching piece on the back. And on here, you can see 
these big weights. That's what those round things are. They're weights. Um, I've, I've talked to people that have done this as well. Most people did it when they were young and then quit because they got scared of it. And most people that I have talked to say they would never do it again, ever. Um, it, it's, it's not safe in any way. You have the thing on the top and he's got it too with the air hose, the air hose attached. You can actually see his air hose. Um, when they first started doing this, which was obviously much later in the harvesting, right? Um, they used bicycle pumps. So you had to have somebody that you really trusted on the boat because they were going to pump to supply you air. Later on, people would get um, like a, a compressor or something. They would get an, uh, an engine, you know, to supply their air. Again, you got to have somebody washing it to make sure that you're getting enough air because the thing is, once you put this helmet on, you're in the water when you put it on. You get in the water and then you put it on your head and you sink to the bottom. Once you put it on and you go underwater, you can't take it off. So if you don't have any air, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. It's not a happy fun time, right? You put it on, if you, if you do run out of air and you're pulling on, a lot of times they would run ropes down to, to attach to a bucket or a bag because while you're down there, you're picking up muscles, right? So if you're pulling on the rope and you're not getting any air and nobody is responding to you and, and you got it, it's now or never, right? Your option is you bend over and Drop it that way. That's the only way you can take it off. Once you do that, you either leave it on the bottom of the river or you have to go back and get it later. Um, from what I've heard, there are probably quite a few of these on the bottom of the river because most people, once it happens, they don't want it again because they're not going to use it. Um, pretty, pretty harrowing experience from all the accounts that I have heard. Um, this method is not, it's not as effective as the brailing. But that photograph, the Turner Brown photograph, was taken in the 90s. So when people, when people harvest mussels now, this is the way that they're doing it nine times out of 10. Um, the, the 1990s? The 1990s. <laughs> yes, the 1990s. So, in a, so basically, in 100 years, we go from people wading around in the water and just picking up whatever they can find close to the shore to people putting on, on diving helmets and sticking to the bottom. Now, once you're on the bottom, um, you're usually feeling with your hands and feet so you can't wear shoes. And you just pick them blindly, pick them up. Um, and again, I've talked to, because I've talked to people who have done this, and it's so great if you can ever find anybody who's done this, they have the best stories. How do you know what type of mussel it is. How do you know if it's big enough? There are size requirements for mussels. And he says, again, it's experience. You just know. You can tell by feel. So the people that are doing this can actually pick up a mussel and tell you what species it is without being able to see it. And that, to me, is amazing. Because I can, looking at them, nine times out of 10, I can't tell you what kind it is. They all just kind of look the same to me. Um, anyway, I always thought that was pretty interesting. You still have the same process going on. You still have, you get them out and you steam them open, which is a smelly, smelly job. And then you gather the, whatever pearls that you find that are in there. And then you're still, at this point, they were still shipping them off to be made into buttons somewhere. Um, the button industry, it started dying out around the Second World War. So there was a really big decline during the Great Depression. And a lot of that had to do with technology as we develop plastics, which are cheaper and more durable. If you've ever had mother of pearl buttons, while they're really, really pretty, they're also pretty brittle and they're pretty easy to crack. It's kind of like having a glass button. Um, plastic buttons are much harder to destroy and cheaper to make and, and easier and they don't uh, involve the killing of animals, which a lot of people if they really thought about where their mother of pearl buttons came from, would probably be opposed to. Um, also zippers, things that people don't think about. The time before zippers, that was when pearl buttons were really big. So zippers were invented about 1917 and they started putting them on clothes in the 20s. Um, combine that with the economic, the, just the overall economic downturn during the Great Depression, right? And nobody's buying buttons because they can't afford to. Mother of pearl buttons were always expensive. Um, and that's why, that's why people always had the jar of buttons in their house. And your mom or your grandma 
I would take all the buttons off your clothes before they threw them away or whatever they did with them. It's because those buttons were so expensive. Um, but when you have a cheaper option, you're always going to go with that, or people typically do. Uh, until the Second World War, uh, when we kind of get a resurgence, so when the government put restrictions on metal use, which some people have been making metal buttons, um, you also can't make metal zippers, so you go back to making the pearl buttons, which don't use up any of your rations, and they don't, um, they don't take metal away from the war effort. After that, it was a pretty sharp decline. After the Second World War, when people could go back to using the plastics and the metals, they did, because it makes a more dependable product. Um, so you do have this big decline, especially in the 50s. There were still some of the button factories, the, the ones here in Arkansas, the button blank factories. There were still some of those up into the 50s. Um, there was one in Newport. I think the last one in Arkansas was the one in Newport. They stayed open into the 60s or 70s. Uh, but it was very small scale. It's like one guy, and he had a button lathe, and this is what he did in his spare time. And that kind of brings us to this industry is not dead. It just changed again. And so people don't, people don't know, right? Um, this is a picture of the bar just moving the muscles. So it's not like this anymore. And it probably never will be again um, for a lot of reasons. The first off being that the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission heavily regulates where and how you can harvest mussels now. Um, only certain parts of the river, only certain species, only certain sizes. And that's because we're still trying to build back the population after they were over harvested, after they depleted all those <coughs> mussel beds, we're still, we're still trying to build it back. Um, the water quality has also changed a lot in the White River, especially where I'm at on the lower part. So the lower White River is considered anything below Jackson Port we the lower White River. It has to do with navigation. Um, anyway, we're below all the dams, right? If you can imagine a mental picture of Arkansas and the White River, all of the dams in the northern part, they affected us. I mean, I know that they're great for tourism and fishing and stuff up there, but they really affected our water quality. It changed the temperature. And that's a really big deal for mussels. They're really sensitive to that. Um, because it also changed what fish were in the river, Right? Anybody who fishes knows that it did change the fish populations. Um, I don't know if you guys know much about a mussel's life cycle, which is strange. They spend part of their early life as a parasite. So they actually attach to the gills of certain species of fish. So each species of mussel has a, a species or two of fish that they prefer. I don't know how they know, but they know. I don't know. I don't know, but somehow they know. I think it has to do with where the fish is going, um, what the temperatures are, what the nutrients are, things like that. So at that time, the mussel gets all of its nutrients from the fish. So if that fish population declines, that mussel population declines, right? And mussels are also filter feeders. Remember we mentioned that before. Um, so if you change the water temperature and then you add a bunch of agricultural runoff, the mussel populations are not going to bounce back as quickly as they would have, right? So all of those factors combined to making it a very, very, very small industry today. It is still happening. You have to have a permit. You have to, to know what you're doing. But people are still doing this. Uh, there's not nearly as much money to be made in it. But what they do now, and it's so cool because really they're going full circle. So we start this industry with pearls and then we go to shells. Now we're gonna go back to pearls, but in a completely different way. So this man kept the, the shelling industry alive in Arkansas, and his name is, um, oh, I'm gonna to have to read it, Kikichi Mikimoto. Okay, so this is the guy that figured out, after 20 years of research, how to make a cultured pearl. Uh, it was invented in Japan, and it's still mostly done in Japan and China. Um, some in Australia, but Pacific Rim is where this is typically done. So instead of taking the mussel shells that we harvest now and cutting the blanks out of them, they cut, I don't know if you can see it, this teeny tiny, this teeny tiny sphere and just a little ball, right? And they actually, 
it's actually a complicated process to get to this, but they cut it up into cubes and then they polish it and tumble it around until it gets round. I don't know. Anyway, so they get this out of the shell and then they ship these to Japan and China and all of the places that are making cultured pearls. So this is the product that we're producing now from freshwater mussels. Um, and it's just so small. But because it's made out of a mussel shell, it is actually made out of the same thing as a pearl. So a pearl forms when an irritant gets in a mussel and the mussel coats it with layer after layer after layer of nacre, which is the inside of the shell, the really shiny stuff that's pretty. Um, that's what he figured out how to do. If you put a piece of shell into a, a mussel or where they're doing this commercially, it's marine oysters then you're gonna, they're going to coat it over and over and over and over and over and you're going to get a cultured pearl. So when you buy cultured pearls, probably up to 90% of that pearl is actually the shell of a freshwater mussel. And it could have come from Arkansas, right? It's not a huge industry now, but it does still happen. Um, there is a farm in Tennessee where they do this in the United States. It may be the only one. If it's not, there might be one in Hawaii. I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it is really cool. They do seed them, not just one per mussel either, which is what usually happens in nature. They seed like six or eight or 10 of them at a time into one oyster, which they're, they're pretty large, so there's room. Um, and then they wait about a year. And in that time when the mussel is coating it over and over and over, you do get the pearl. Um, whether, whether you buy cultured or real, I don't know. But the cultured ones, this is what they do and it's pretty cool. And, that's the guy that invented it. So he saved our muscling industry as small as it is now because that's the only thing you can do with them, right? So that's my story and I'm sticking to it, <laughs> right? But it is, it is really interesting and it is something, I don't know why they don't teach it in school. It is such a way of life. A lot of the people that did this, that did this and that did this, they lived in houseboats on the river and some of them never had a permanent residence on land. And so this is, it's huge. Where I'm at, everybody is related to somebody that did this. Everybody's related to, to somebody that worked at a, a button factory. And it's just, it's so, it's so cool. <laughs>